Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions, and the first group is on communities and local government. We'll start with number one from Gil Patterson. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is tackling fuel poverty. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Our fuel poverty bill passed stage three earlier this month. Uh, with unanimous support from across the chamber and requires us to publish a strategy for tackling fuel poverty that will set out the approach to tackling the four drivers of fuel poverty, use of energy, energy efficiency, income and energy prices. Uh, we're already making progress. The latest figures show that Scotland's fuel poverty rate uh, was now at the lowest since 2005-06 and we are continuing to invest significantly to support households. By the end of 2021, uh, we will have allocated over £1 billion since 2009 to make homes warmer and cheaper to heat. And this money has attracted hundreds of millions more in energy company contributions, funding by local authorities, landlords and individual householders. And through our award-winning Home Energy Scotland service, we are also providing households with advice and support, including benefits checks and energy supplier switching where appropriate. Gil Patterson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very full uh, answer? Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary join with me congratulating, congratulating Now's Housing Association and faithfully in Clyde Bank, who received a visit from the Board of Ofgem this week in recognition of their exceptional work in reducing poverty and embracing the use of renewables where they have installed roof solar panels on most of their own properties. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I'm delighted to join Gil Patterson in congratulating Nose Housing Association uh, for the great work that they have done, uh, both in helping uh, their tenants pay less for their energy, but also in tackling climate change. Uh, they've been ahead of the game uh, in the, their use of solar to decarbonise and reduce bills for their tenants. Uh, and I'm glad that this is being recognised. Uh, along with uh, confirmation of our new energy efficiency standard for social housing, details have also been provided earlier today of the second round of our decarbonisation fund. A further three and a half million pounds is available to social landlords to invest in projects that improve energy efficiency and reduce a building's carbon footprint. Projects with outcomes just like those that Mr. Patterson has mentioned uh, in knows. Alec Rowley to be followed by Lee McCarthy. Sorry, no, officer, the billion pound that the minister talks about is not to be scoffed at in terms of investment. However, the um, existing Homes Alliance state the government's committed funding falls well short of what is required for a national infrastructure project and to meet climate change and fuel poverty targets. So whilst accepting the investment that has gone in, does he accept that if we are going to tackle fuel poverty, we're going to see, need to see much greater investment going in to do so? Um, President Officer, as Mr Riley says, a billion pounds is not to be uh, sniffed at at all. Uh, and what we need to do um, is use all of the resources at our disposal uh, to ensure that we get the biggest bang for our buck uh, in terms of uh, energy uh, efficiency. Um, and I'm very pleased that, uh, again today, we have announced another three and a half million pounds uh, for uh, decarbonisation, uh, which will be available uh, to social uh, housing landlords. Uh, but beyond that, this is not just about the amount of money that the government spends, it is about using money from other sources as well um, to ensure that we get the best possible outcomes uh, for energy efficiency, not just in the domestic sector, uh, but also in the commercial sector. And Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I warmly welcome, as the Minister will be aware, um, the passing of the Fuel Poverty uh, Act. Uh, but of course, achieving those ambitions uh, will be driven very much through the Fuel Poverty Strategy. Can the Minister update uh, Parliament on the timing uh, of the uh, completion of that strategy? And can he also explain how the resources, uh, both government resources and those leveraged in, uh, will be used to target extreme fuel poverty in remote and rural and island areas? Um, uh, I thank Mr MacArthur for his question. Uh, we'll be publishing the fuel poverty strategy uh, in 2020 uh, and that will set out how we'll be working towards our target 
taking actions across all four drivers of heel poverty. Um, in the meantime, uh, we'll continue to provide significant levels of support uh, through our home energy efficiency programmes. Uh, as Mr uh, MacArthur is well aware, uh, Orkney uh, and the islands benefit uh, to a greater degree per head of population than anywhere else uh, when it comes to the energy efficiency programmes, rightly so. Uh, and what we need to do as we move forward, and we uh, don't have to uh, wait uh, until the strategy is in place per se, is to look at how we target those who are in extreme fuel poverty, as has been outlined in the bill as passed, uh, and ensuring uh, folks like Mr MacArthur's constituents benefit as soon as we possibly can in terms of the resourcing to tackle extreme fuel poverty. Question number two, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce the number of empty homes. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, long term empty homes are a wasted resource at a time when we need more homes right across Scotland. Uh, so we'll continue to fund the work of the Scottish em Empty Homes Partnership with over £1.2 million across three years to provide advice and support. Uh, the partnership brought 1,128 homes back into use last year, a rise of over 300, thanks to the work of dedicated empty homes officers. It's essential that all local authorities see and adopt the benefits of this approach. Uh, more can be done, uh, and we are reviewing our empty homes policy to ensure that we maximise the numbers brought back into use. And I, uh, and I will carefully consider uh, the Local Government and Communities Committee's inquiry into empty homes in doing so. Alison Jones. Um, only 4,340 homes have been brought back into use since 2010, so at the current rate of progress we'll have to wait 173 years until all empty homes in Scotland are in use. Local authorities have a role to play, but surely the Minister must recognise that national leadership is key, that legislation may be required, and that current funding may be insufficient to address the fact that more than 83,000 homes in Scotland lie empty and unused while we have a crisis in homelessness. Minister. Uh, President Officer, um, as I indicated in my initial answer, 1,128 homes last year uh, were brought back into use th thanks to the very successful partnership that the government has with shelter um, and uh, local authorities. Uh, and I pay tri tribute to uh, Shahina Din, who has been at the forefront uh, all of, uh, in, in dealing with all of this. Um, my disappointment lies with local authorities that have yet to bring empty homes officers into play. Um, and within uh, uh, Ms Johnson's own region here um, in Lothian, um, we have seen very little progress from councils, uh, whereby those councils who have made the investment uh, in empty homes officers are seeing huge benefits uh, from their work, uh, from uh, uh, Dumfries and Galloway to, 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 to Orkney. So I would uh, appeal to all local authorities uh, to put empty homes officers in place. Uh, in terms of uh, national versus local responsibility, uh, that is what we will look at during the course of the review, uh, and I will continue to keep Parliament updated. Question number three, Runa Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to encourage local authorities to engage with community councils. Cabinet Secretary, Eileen Campbell. Thank you. Local authorities have statutory oversight of community councils under the Local Government Scotland Act 1973 and are responsible for engaging with the community councils in their local area. Supporting this work, the Scottish Government engages collaboratively with COSLA, the Improvement Service and Community Council Liaison Officers to support community councils and ensure their voices are heard. Rona Mackay. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In my own constituency of Strathkelvin and Bearsden, Eastern Eastern Bartonshire Council rarely engage with community councils and as such membership in several areas is declining due to the perception of not being heard. Does the Minister agree that local authorities should make every effort to work with community councils who are representatives of grass grassroots matters in every constituency and they should be valued much more than they are? 
Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, and uh, I thank uh, Rona Mackay for raising this issue. And I'm aware that of some of the local issues in Strathkelvin and, and Bears Den, but I also understand that East Dunbartonshire Council uh, community planning team are working with their community councils to resolve some of those issues. And I would agree, community councils have a really important part to play in local democracy. They bridge the, the gap between local authorities and communities and help to make sure that public bodies are aware of the opinions and needs of the communities that they represent. And as I said, local authorities have that statutory oversight of their community councils and also are required to consult community councils about planning applications and licensing matters so they're absolutely fundamental for local democracy and I hope that the community planning team help resolve some of the frustrations that uh, Ms Mackay uh, describes and happy to further engage with her uh, on this if she requires it but also more generally on the local governance review about making sure that we can uh, hear the voices of community councils in that uh, uh, bit of consultation work. Question number four David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Fife Council on the action that is taken to regenerate town centres across Fife. Cabinet Secretary, Ian Campbell. Okay, thank you. The Scottish Government has regular discussions with Fife Council about what action it is taking to regenerate town centres across Fife. This has included its recent allocation of town centre fund investment of 4.3 million across towns in uh, the authority. We want our towns and town centres to be vibrant, creative, enterprising and accessible. And it's essential that we support town centres to become more diverse and sustainable as they face the challenge of changing and evolving retail patterns. We will invest to deliver inclusive growth so that town and neighbourhood centres can be thriving places for communities to live, work and enjoy. David Torrance. Answer. There are several funds available to councils and communities that can be used for community projects, regeneration and the conversion of retail properties into a living, living accommodation. Can the Cabinet Secretary clarify, is there any thought to a multi-year central fund that would encompass all the above, but would also have capital and revenue element in it? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. I, and I absolutely would agree and aware of the importance of multi-year funding in offering security to organisations. And that is the approach that we've taken through our new Investing in Communities Fund. Uh, happy to engage with uh, Mr Torrance on ideas he has for the funding model he described around uh, looking at imaginative ways to convert retail properties into living accommodation. Uh, and uh, happily to, happy to explore that. Uh, but absolutely, we understand that that multi-year funding model for communities is absolutely essential. Essential. While there's no plans for the one that he described, certainly happy to take on board his, his ideas uh, and build on the work that we've done through the Investing in Communities Fund. Alexander Stewart, followed by Mark Bruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Taxpayers Alliance, in its report Hollow High Streets, found that Scotland has 1,146 vacant owned council commercial properties, costing £31.8 million to maintain. Can I ask? Uh, what measures the Scottish Government will put in place to encourage councils to bring these properties back into use so that they can stop hemorrhaging precious funds uh, that are required because that is the highest of any region in the UK. Cabinet Secretary. And we continue to work and engage with local authorities uh, in partnership. I've outlined some of the funding that we've uh, given to uh, local authorities through the Town Centre Fund investment because ultimately we all agree, I think we all agree across the political parties, that we want our town centres to be vibrant. And if there are things that we can do to make and ensure that gap sites in town centres can be filled, then absolutely we'll continue to have that engagement because we know that everyone, regardless of where they are in the country, wants their high streets to be flourishing, vibrant places for people to enjoy and for people to spend their money in uh, and to create the, 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 the good places that we all want to, to live in. So uh, on top of uh, the funding that I outlined around the Town Centre Fund, there is a huge number of other uh, funding streams that we have and work with local authorities. For instance, the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund and a whole host of other ways in which we want to ensure that we have got good places and spaces to live. And Mark Gruskell. Business improvement districts are needed to regenerate our town centres, but we see too many bids controlled by big businesses making controversial decisions on projects like the land train in Stirling or in the case of Dunfermline to just shut the bid completely. Does the Minister share my concern that bids don't always act in the wider community interest? What reforms to membership can be put in place to make them more genuinely representative of the communities that they serve? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, and, and, uh, aware of uh, some of the uh, bid issues in the Fife uh, region, but good bids, I would say, to not look at it in the negative way in which 
Mark Ruskell has contextualised that bids, bids continue to be a key platform for promoting local economic development and uh, that's why we continue to support the work and the good work that is moving forward and I know that there's also work to evolve the bid model to make sure that it has a much more community based focus so it can be fully representative of the views of the people and the businesses within that district and there's lots of great examples of where people and communities and businesses have worked together to ensure that we create the thriving uh, town centres that we all want to see happening across uh, the country. Uh, he can write to me if there are ideas that he wants to take forward as we further uh, evolve the bid model to make sure that we do get a representative viewpoint from the bid and the bid process and support uh, those people who are continuing to uh, champion bids uh, across town centres uh, in the country to make sure that we can uh, see those flourishing and vibrant town centres. Question number five, Donald Cameron. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of reports of a shift in the population from the west coast to the east over the next few years to access better housing. Cabinet Secretary Ian Campbell. The Scottish Government has established a ministerial task group to consider Scotland's future population challenges and develop new solutions to address demographic and population change. As part of this task group, we'll be looking at a number of factors, uh, including housing. Donald Cameron. The Cabinet Secretary will know of the forecasted long-term trends of depopulation in Argyll and Butte. Given that the recently announced task group that the Cabinet Secretary has just mentioned looking into this is only made up of Scottish ministers, can she reassure members that this group will also consult widely and seek expert external opinion as well? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, uh, and uh, I'm glad that the, the member does welcome the fact that we're looking at this issue, the issue that he describes, and he's right to point out too about that, that movement from the west to the east. Uh, the, the group is chaired by uh, Fiona Hislop, and I'm sure as that group evolves, it will seek to uh, ensure that people can contribute uh, and organisations can contribute their thoughts and views. I would also align uh, this work that Fiona Hislop is doing to the work that I'm taking forward around looking at a new housing system after 2021. And certainly we're going to be making sure that we're very consultative. We've already engaged with a huge number of expert groups, the whole housing system in its fullest sense. And certainly I would extend uh, an invite to, to Donald Cameron if he has some particular issues he he wants to raise about things that he sees in the area that he represents that he thinks should be fundamental to this review of housing that he should absolutely get in touch with me happy to engage with him happy to make sure that this housing system works for Scotland in its fullest sense and addresses some of the population uh, issues that he's articulated question number six Stuart McWillan uh, thank you signing off to ask the Scottish Government when it last met Inverclyde Council to discuss housing provision Mr Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Scottish Government officials last meeting with Inverclyde Council uh, to discuss housing issues was on the 5th of June. Uh, Scottish Government officials regularly meet with local authorities throughout the year to discuss housing provision. Stuart McMillan. Thank the Minister for that reply. And does the Minister agree with me that uh, whether there's already a strain on local infrastructure as well as genuine safety concerns from the public, then Inverclyde Council should certainly reconsider a local development plan proposals to grind Kern Drive, George Road and Lutfield Road to a halt, which I'd be more than happy to show the Minister if he wished to visit Inverclyde in the summer. Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, um, as in Inverclyde local development plan is currently uh, before Scottish uh, Ministers, um, it uh, would be inappropriate for me to comment uh, on the plan. However, generally speaking, Scottish planning policy states that development should be aligned uh, with transport infrastructure and plans and decisions should take account of the implications of development proposals on traffic, patterns of travel and road safety. Question number seven, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the third sector regarding the impact on it of the findings of the report handing back contracts and its ability to contract a range of public services from local authorities. Cabinet Secretary Ian Campbell. Thank you. We know that change is needed in social care support and that is why on the 12th of June, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport launched a national programme with Councillor Curry, the COSLA spokesperson for health and social care, to support local reform of social care support. It has joint, been jointly led with COSLA, whose members are responsible for delivering and procuring these vital public services. The Scottish Government is in regular dialogue with the Coalition of Care and Support Providers in Scotland and Scottish Care on a range of issues, including contracting, and they have had a central role in shaping the work that is required to improve the support and care that people require. Ingrid. 
Well, it's good to talk, but perhaps the Cabinet Secretary can tell us um, exactly what measures the Government have in mind to try and address this growing trend which threatens the sustainability uh, of the uh, model of social care around our country. Mr. Secretary. Uh, okay, it's good to talk, but absolutely this government isn't just about talking and we have following this reform of social care with uh, coherent action. Integrated uh, authorities manage £9 billion of funding, which was previously managed separately by health boards and councils. We've uh, increased our package of investment in social care and integration to exceed £700 million, underlining our commitment to support older people and disabled people and support the commitment to pay the living wage. So we're committed to attracting and uh, retaining the right people and raising the status of social care uh, as a profession. I could go on and list a whole host of other actions that we've taken as a government to make sure that we do support uh, social care and that integration process backed up not just by warm words but by with significant investment and significant process. Yeah. And I'll squeeze in question eight, Alison Harris. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the local government revenue provision outturns and budget estimates which records councils using reserves to keep services running. Okay, the Scottish Government has provided local government with a real terms funding increase in 2018-19 and 2019-20. We welcome this as reflected in the provisional outturn and budget estimates which confirms net revenue spending by local authorities has increased by 292 million or 2.4% in 18-19. Net revenue and capital budget estimates have also increased respectively by £497 million and £730 million in 1920. Decisions on the use of reserves are rightly the responsibility of councils to take where it is prudent and sustainable to do so. Alison Harris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. If councils are having to spend from their reserves to provide everyday services, then I think we can all agree that something is wrong. What assistance can the Cabinet Secretary give and offer to local authorities to ensure that everyday services are in fact funded through sustainable means and not out of revenue? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it is up to each local authority how it manages, manages its day-to-day -day businesses and best allocates its resources. It, and I think the best advice I can give to local authorities is that at least it was this government that took the action around the, the spending decisions at the budget and not Alison Harrison's uh, yeah, party. Because, yeah. for instance, if we'd followed the tax plans of the Conservatives, then Falkirk Council would be minus £14.4 million. And I think that the decisions that this government has taken go a long way to support the, the, the policies and processes that local government across the country are taking and they're better off for it. Yeah. Uh, mo moving on to social security and older people, question number one from John Scott. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in developing new face-to-face -face assessments for the new devolved benefits. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. The consultation on disability assistance in Scotland, which closed on the 28th of May 2000, uh, 2019, sets out the Scottish Government's proposals relating to face-to-face -face assessments. The process of designing Social Security Scotland's assessment service is underway and will be shaped by consultation analysis, engagement with experience panels and input from stakeholders. We are committed to providing individuals with person-centred assessments delivered by suitably qualified assessors. Individuals will have a greater choice and control over their assessment and will be treated with dignity, fairness and respect throughout. John Scott. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. But can the Scottish Government give assurances that recruitment for mental health specialists for face-to-face -face assessments will not adversely impact on recruitment streams for other policy areas requiring mental health specialists and will every effort be made to avoid any such adverse impacts? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we're very cognizant as we move forward with our workforce uh, planning for the Social Security Agency and with the assessments um, in particular uh, to be mindful of working not just for Social Security, but working across government and having those discussions uh, with uh, the Health Directorate and also with the professional bodies as well within the medical profession, for example. That work is um, ongoing and I can assure John Scott that we will be very mindful of that as we move forward with the final phases of planning uh, for the disability assistance packages. And Maureen Ward? Uh, many of us will be aware of the often cruel and unnecessary assessments carried out by the DWP. In Scotland, we have a chance to do things differently with our new social security powers. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that where assessments are needed, 
they will be delivered through the agency and never the private sector, and that assessments will be flexible and will be offered at a time and place that suit the claimant. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm very happy to confirm once again that the assessments and um, any case management will, of course, be delivered by Social Security Scotland and there will be no role for the private sector in that. It is very important as we develop our system that we listen to the feedback of those who have went through the UK system. They describe it themselves as having created stress and trauma um, for sometimes those that are the most vulnerable in our society and that's exactly why we have to listen to that feedback and ensure that we do not repeat uh, the same uh, problems within our system. We are very clear that we will have a system that will allow people to be seen um, at a place and at a time that is convenient to them. That's the very least I think that they can hope for but of course I would reiterate that we are determined to significantly reduce the requirement for face-to-face -face assessments by um, using our case managers to ensure that we're getting the right decision with the right information uh, before things have to get to a face-to-face -face assessment at all. Question number two, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making with preparing to commence the delivery of disability assistance for children and young people. Cabinet Secretary. We've made significant progress with the preparations for commencing the delivery of disability assistance for children and young people, and we are on track to deliver by the summer of next year in line with our commitments. Development of the application process is well underway. This is being designed with the people of Scotland who are engaging and testing our designs on a frequent basis to ensure it is as easy as possible for people to apply for disability assistance in Scotland. Murder Fraser. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response? The Motability Scheme currently provides people with disabilities more independence, more employability opportunities and reduces social isolation. If we are creating an equivalent Scottish motability scheme, what plans are in place to ensure that there are the necessary uh, number of cars, scooters or powered wheelchairs in place for those who need them? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Murdo Fraser is, raises a very important issue and I, I'm pleased to be able to have the opportunity to uh, provide reassurance on this aspect that uh, we are ensuring that uh, motability assistance, as is known through the, the UK system, it will be available. Now, it's very important that we do that because it, it has, as Murdo Fraser has, has, has detailed, has significant posit positive benefits for the individuals involved. And we need to ensure that the same level of service that those people have uh, been used to under the motability system is absolutely available to them uh, once we have the devolution of the disability assistance benefits in Scotland. So I hope that provides Murdo Fraser and the Chamber with some reassurance that we are determined to provide that service um, as the benefits are devolved. Question number three, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Social Security Committee's recommendation that the housing element of universal credit should be paid directly to a landlord by default with the option for a tenant to opt out. Cabinet Secretary. As part of the development of the UC Scottish Choices in 2017, we worked directly with people in receipt of UC. <clears throat> the feedback from that was that people wished to have a choice about whether or not to have the housing costs in their UC award paid directly to their landlord. The evidence so far shows that almost 50% of the people who have been offered the choices have taken up one or both. In other words, they have decided for themselves whether it works better for them to have their housing costs paid directly to their landlord. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response? She'll be aware that last week the Scottish Association of Landlords welcomed the report and in particular backed the move to pay the housing element direct to landlords as the default. The Cabinet Secretary knows that it can reduce the risk of, for landlords but it can also secure tenancies by preventing arrears and was backed overwhelmingly by those who gave evidence to the committee and of course the committee itself. Will the Cabinet Secretary support that recommendation and commit to allowing the money to go straight to landlords to ensure Scotland's powers are used to maximum effect to support and protect tenants? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I do appreciate where, where um, uh, Jackie Bailey is coming from on this issue. However, I would point out to her, as I said in my original statement, when we asked people directly in receipt of UC what they wanted to happen, they asked to have the choice. 
So it's very important as we build a system that works for the people that are receiving a service that their, um, their asks and their requests are taken on board. So I fully appreciate that the Scottish Association of Landlords and others um, have, have asked for that to look at. I appreciate the committee has asked to look at. As I said uh, to the, the committee as we were going forward with the Scottish Government's response on this, it is important we actually listen to the individual requests and asks in this as well, not just the landlords, and try to balance uh, those, those judgments up. And that's exactly why we took the decision uh, to ensure that that choice lies with the individual um, initially. Now, there is a review of UC choices coming up uh, at the end um, of this year. This may be something that people might want to look at from that, but certainly the responses that we had when we initially developed that project from people directly was they wanted that choice themselves. And Shona Robertson. The report also showed that uh, the five-week delay for universal credit has greatly increased rent arrears and the uh, ineffective communication and poor exchange of information by the DWP inevitably has a human cost. Does the Cabinet Secretary think that this is yet further evidence of the mishandling of universal credit under this Tory government? And does she agree that it is unsustainable for the Scottish Government to continue to mitigate UK government welfare cuts, which of course will reduce the social security spending ability by £3.7 billion? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Sean Robinson is quite right to point out and once again highlight the impact of the f at minimum five-week delay for uh, UC claimants receiving uh, their first uh, payments. This does uh, greatly increase um, rent arrears, as she points out, and it uh, has a, a severe um, impact on, on people, not just in terms of the money, but in terms of uh, the, the stress and difficulty that are going through at a very difficult time. Research conducted by COSLA suggests that rent arrears increased by an average of 26% across all UC full service local authority areas between March 2016 and March 2018. And that is highly concerning, not just for the individuals involved, but for the landlords too. Uh, we are, as a Scottish government, uh, doing all we can to mitigate the, against the worst excesses of the UK government's policies, spending, for example, more than £125 million in 2019-20. But as Shona Robertson quite rightly points out, the scale of the challenge, £3.7 billion, is simply unsustainable for any government eh, to be able to fully mitigate against. Question number four, Bob Doris. Uh, thanks, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many carers in receipt of carers allowing supplement in the Glasgow, Mary Hill and Springburn constituency. Cabinet Secretary. Although figures at constituency level are not available, 13,475 carers in Glasgow are currently in receipt of carers allowing supplement. This week, the third payment of carers allowing supplement was made to carers in Scotland since we introduced it in September 2018. As a result, Scotland's carers who are eligible for both payments will receive an extra £452.40 in 2019-20 in recognition of the significant contribution they make. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And I'm also pleased the Scottish Government will provide extra, support for young, extra financial support for young carers also in Scotland. But that will be the first of its kind in the UK. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how she will ensure that all those who qualify for the Young Carers Grant will receive it? And does she agree that it's important they, they do so, given the huge contribution that young carers make? Cabinet Secretary. I uh, would absolutely agree uh, with Bob Dorsey's uh, statement that young carers do make an invaluable contribution to our society. That's why we are determined to do all we can to maximise take-up of the Young Carers Grant. As we do with all the payments made by Social Security Scotland, there will be bespoke communications packages uh, that will drive that uh, take-up strategy. And they will have to be very, obviously, particularly um, balanced for the Young Carers Grant to ensure that we're targeting that communications directly to young carers themselves, their family and friends who may support them, for example, and make sure that that application is available um, in a multiple of formats to cater for all disability accessibility needs. And Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Carers and carers organisations would like to see changes to carers allowance, like a removal of the restriction on studying, um, a change to the earning threshold and restrictions around the number of people um, cared for. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out what the Government's ambition for changes to carers allowance as a whole when um, agency arrangements with the DWP come to an end? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, we will ensure that we will um, have a full consultation and um, public consultation to discuss all the possible changes uh, that could be made and that people want to, to, to see to, to the carers' uh, allowance. Um, we are delivering this through an agency agreement with the DWP at this point, and uh, I would restate once again the reason for that is to ensure that the first action that this government took uh, with the new Social Security Scotland within its first couple of weeks of opening was to deliver the carers' allowance supplement directly to carers, ensuring that we got money into carers' pockets as quickly as possible. Thank you. Number question number five, Gordon Lindhurst. To ask the Scottish Government what reviews it has carried out of the costs of delivering and implementing Wave 2 benefits. Cabinet Secretary. The Social Security programme level business case is currently being reviewed and will be finalised shortly. We recently completed an internal review of the finance function for the Social Security programme. Its focus is on ensuring our financial arrangements are evolving in line with the complexity of the programme and an update on the implementation costs will be provided to Parliament in due course. Gordon Linders. Um, could we have a more precise timetable as to when that will be provided to Parliament? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I, I hope Gordon Lindhurst appreciates, we have very recently closed the consultation on disability assistance. That work, we will have to analyse the work within that disability assistance consultation because the policy decisions that will fall from that may have implications uh, to the, the reviews that he was speaking about. Therefore, it's very important that we ensure that that work is completed to be able to feed in to, to the, the review work to ensure that the uh, up is as comprehensive as possible. Question number six, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reports that services for older people in Dumfries and Galloway are facing an in-year deficit of 6.85 million. Minister Christina McKelvey. Um, whilst this is a matter for Dumfries and Galloway Council, working with Dumfries and Galloway Integration Joint Board, NHS Dumfries and Galloway, Dumfries and Galloway Council are committed to developing a recovery plan which systematically reduces the deficit without reducing capacity by redesigning services and delivery and investing in quality, sustainable care. It is not unusual for integration joint boards to begin the year with a variance against budget and for this to reduce throughout the year as saving plans and developed, are developed and expenditure patterns become clearer. Finlay Carson. Thank the Minister for that response. Over the last 20 years, Dumfries and Galloway's population aged 75 and over rose by 43%. And that population over the next decade is projected to see a 28% rise in the region. With demands for services and increase and major problems surrounding recruiting the required staff for the region, how can the Scottish Government support Dumfries and Galloway's health and social care partnership in laying out their plans to continue to provide these and protect these vital services uh, to make them on par with the rest of Scotland? Minister. Um, it's a really interesting question. A question is uh, older people's minister. He will know I'm taking a, a huge interest in because we have an aging population and populations, uh, uh, you know, demanding more services uh, as we move on through the next few years. And we're working really hard on that. But on specifics about Dumfries and Galloway and the, the progress that they have made in their integration of health and social care, which will be a key driver in all of that progress, all health and social care partnerships completed a self-assessment of their current position on the 15th of May 2019. And I think that will go some way to help us understand what some of those pressures are. Ensuring quality, sustainable care and support for individuals at home and in homely settings requires a whole systems approach and we're working really uh, hard to, to ensure that happens. So the self-assessment uh, approach taken by joint integration boards will provide us with that information. We will plug that into the work that we are doing with the older people's strategy and some of the other strategies that we've got working alongside that so that we can ensure that going forward in the future for all of our older people's organisations and all of our older people's populations that we are providing the best care for them. And Annabel Ewing. Presiding officer, in the members constituency and indeed across Scotland, tens of thousands of older Scots over 75 will be left worse off as a result of the UK government scrapping the free TV licence. Does the minister agree that after years of Tory austerity, the last thing our older people need is more money being taken out of their pockets by the Tories? Minister. Um, it, the member will not be surprised. I totally and utterly agree with her. When I attended the Scottish Pensioner Forum at conference just two weeks ago, this was a hot topic on, on the agenda. So I absolutely agree. The UK government have shirked 
the responsibility to support older people and they've pushed that onto the BBC, an absolute abdication of that, their government on a welfare policy. So the plan to link the licence to pension credit will fail to help many vulnerable people as we know that many do not actually claim it. The policy is an attack on our older people and our most vulnerable people, many already socially isolated and maybe uh, our two prime ministerial candidates should make the commitment to end and reverse the disgraceful decision that they've taken on TV licences for our over 75 population. Question number seven, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support third sector groups to help address loneliness amongst older people. Minister Christina McKay. Well, I'm delighted to, uh, to tell Miles Briggs, but no doubt he'll not you will already realise how delighted I was to launch a Connected Scotland, our national strategy for tackling social isolation and loneliness and building social connections that recognises the vital contribution of the third sector in supporting all vulnerable groups, including older people, in tackling these issues. There are a number of third sector organisations on the National Implementation Group, which I'm chairing, that meets this week. So we are looking, really looking forward to, to that meeting, to taking forward uh, all of that. Many of the organisations, including the Scottish Pensioner Forum, Age Scotland, and many of the organisations who deliver those services will be part of that implementation group. So we're also supporting a number of third sector organisations to do vital work in this area, including funding Age Scotland for the Silver Line and the Shed Effect Scheme. Miles Briggs. Um, I welcome the publication of a Connected Scotland strategy. I'm wondering if the minister, minister could outline to Parliament how local groups, for example, can help build capacity. Here in my own region, for example, we have groups like Vintage Vibe, Health in Mind and Connect to the Elderly. Um, how will the strategy work to actually help them reach out to more people affected by loneliness? Minister. No. Um, absolutely, absolutely. It, it's, that's a key theme of the work that the implementation group it, it is working on. When we it, compiled the strategy, many of those groups it, gave us their thoughts and their feelings on how they can it, take part in the, the process of doing this. We know absolutely that none of this will work out there in the community unless the community is involved and bought into it. So we have invited them all to take part in that and I've been at loads of visits uh, in order to understand some of that. So uh, he, he will understand how important that is. So the Older People's uh, Strategy, the Older People's Strategic Action Forum, of which I chair as well, alongside the social isolation and loneliness strategy, the key themes of that is how do we ensure that communities can provide those services, be sustainable in those services, be made by those communities, for those communities, to really focus on that. And a perfect example is the Football Memory Scheme, which celebrated its 10th anniversary, and I visited with them last uh, week when they have gone into partnership with Greater Glasgow uh, Clyde Health Board to network all of the work they do in football memories and the, the great impact that has on older people as well. So absolutely, if Miles Briggs has got organisations in his area who want to talk to me about that, please uh, come and let me know because the more ideas I've got, the more we can reflect a policy that meets the, the demands of the people. Thank you. Apologies to Liam Kerr as we don't have time uh, for any more questions in that section. But we turn to finance, economy and fair work. Question number one, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government when the Finance Secretary last met Glasgow Airport to discuss the economy and fair work. Cabinet Secretary Dermot Mackay. I've had a telephone discussion with Glasgow Airport on the 7th of May to discuss matters relating to my role as Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work. I also attended a meeting with Glasgow Airport on the 17th of June in relation to constituency business. Neil Bibby. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the ongoing industrial action at Glasgow Airport where hundreds of workers, many of whom are our constituents, are striking for fair pay and to stop the closure of their pension scheme. Unite the Union members are understandably frustrated that an airport posting pre-tax profits of over £90 million pounds will not invest a fair share of those profits in its workforce and bring in this dispute to an end. And they're also concerned about reports in the Sunday Post that the use of strike-breaking labour is putting public safety at risk, with 95 suspicious items slipping through security on each of the first two days of strike action. What will the Scottish Government do to help resolve this dispute and ensure that airport workers and the tra travelling public are kept safe? Well, first of all, of, of course, uh, safety uh, in aviation and security is absolutely paramount, uh, and there should be a focus on that, and those standards uh, should be it reduced. Uh, Mr Bibby uh, is of course aware that the Scottish Government doesn't have a, a role in this uh, dispute. I understand uh, that, that there have been talks, hopefully those talks will continue and a resolution can be found to the satisfaction of all, certainly not least uh, the workforce as well, uh, so that uh, operations can absolutely go back uh, to normal and it can be addressed. Whilst the Scottish Government 
uh, doesn't have a role in this, is not a party to the dispute. Of course, I'm uh, happy to uh, engage as Cabinet Secretary if and when that's uh, appropriate. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, if Glasgow Airport is to grow at the rate which it plans to and employ the amount of people that it wants to grow to, the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the severe strains it's putting on infrastructure. The airport um, connectivity must be improved. He'll be aware of the Glasgow Connectivity Commission's recommendations. Uh, can he tell us if the Scottish Government is going to reply formally to any of those recommendations and how he will help support growth and jobs in the Renfrewshire area and beyond? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, of course, within the uh, bounds of uh, uh, decent standards of politicians and ministerial code of conduct. Uh, Glasgow Airport is in my own constituency, so resources would be allocated as appropriate rather than be given any sort of preferential treatment just because it's the Finance and Economy Secretary that represents the airport. I agree with the underlying comments, the premise of the question, that should we ensure that the airport has the best possible connectivity and infrastructure? Yes, I do uh, agree with that. Clearly, the City Deal partners are looking at the issues in relation to the best form of uh, surface access. There's, the resources from the City Deal is still there. Uh, there's still a timetable that can be delivered. The uh, Connectivity uh, Commission it worked very interesting as well. A rather substantial price tag to do all of that work. So I think it should be looked at methodically to see what can be delivered. Because, of course, some of those recommendations are actually different from projects that are currently underway. Um, so it requires proper analysis, but it's more appropriate for transport and infrastructure uh, ministers to respond rather than finance secretary. But, of course, I want to make sure that the infrastructure is there to grow our economy and, indeed, ensure that the airport has a dynamic and successful future. And that's the role that I'll certainly pledge to undertake. Question number two, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the UK Government has provided it, provided it with details of the Shared Prosperity Fund, which it claims will replace European structural funds post-Brexit. Minister Ivan McKee. Despite pressing the UK Government on its proposals for the Shared Prosperity Fund and that any new arrangements must be co-designed with devolved administrations, no details have been provided from the UK Government. We therefore continue to develop our own thinking on future funding arrangements and will engage with lead partners, delivery bodies, individuals and communities across Scotland to inform our thoughts. To enable this, I have confirmed this morning that we will undertake our own consultation overseen by an external steering group to develop a coherent and robust position and ensure the best interests of Scotland are met. Kenneth Gibbs. I thank the Minister for that answer. On, on 5th of December, in response to a question from Patricia Gibson, MP, the Prime Minister said European structural funds, and I quote, will indeed be replaced by the Shared Prosperity Fund. The Government will be consulting before the end of the year. That was the end of last year. Uh, what are the implications of a delay in taking forward this new fund? Minister. Uh, I can uh, let uh, the member know that the Scottish Government has uh, not been consulted on this uh, issue and this lack of consultation and subsequent delay has the potential for significant social and economic impact to local communities and projects, including third sector groups across Scotland receiving support through the current European Structural Funds programme. The Scottish Government, along with Wales and Northern Ireland, must be equal partners in co-designing any system to replace European funding after Brexit, and the UK Government must not impose a system on the nations of the UK. And Richard Leonard. The Industrial Communities Alliance has said that the allocation of the funds within devolved nations, nations should be a matter for devolved governments. So can the Minister share with us uh, what the allocation formula would be should the Scottish Government be in charge of that fund? Minister. Well, the Scottish Government's position is that the amount that comes to Scotland uh, under the new Shared Prosperity Fund would be absolutely no less than we're currently receiving under UK, um, the UK programmes at the moment. That's our position and that's what we are uh, pushing the UK Government on to confirm to make sure there is no uh, detriment and no loss of funding coming to Scotland from the UK Government under the Shared Prosperity Fund. Question number three, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made since August 2018 on increasing the number of foundation, modern and graduate apprenticeships that are offered and taken up? And Min can I note members to my register of interest regarding apprenticeships? Uh, Minister Jamie Hepburn. Uh, official statistics published on the 11th of June 2019 show there are 28,191 new apprenticeship starts in 2018-19, including 921 graduate apprenticeships. 
This was an increase from 2017-18, where the 27,145 modern apprenticeship starts, representing an increase from the year before, where there are 26,262 start, such starts and 278 graduate apprenticeship starts. Work is already underway to expand the offer, providing 29,000 new starts in 2019-20, including up to 1,300 graduate apprentices. There were 2,600 foundation apprenticeship opportunities, opportunities made available across 12 frameworks in 2018, and 5,000 opportunities now available for 2019. Alexander Burnett. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer. Now, last month, the Scottish Conservatives set out our policy to introduce a skills participation age. Now, this would make it law that everybody up until the age of 18 has to either go to school, college or university, or if they want to start work through a structured apprenticeship or a traineeship. Now, we would think thank IPPR Scotland backing this policy to close a massive worker shortage by 2030. Will the Minister clarify if the SNP Government will support such a policy? Minister. Well, we'll do what we're continuing to do right now in delivering success mm. for young people. Right now in the labour market, we have record levels of employment, a record low in uh, unemployment. We have better performance in terms of youth unemployment here in Scotland. We have the upward trajectory of modern apprenticeships I've just referred to. We have record levels of positive destinations. So it suggests to me the system we have is working well. Of course, we seek to refine it. Of course, we seek to improve it. And that's something we're continuing to do through the Developing Young Workforce Agenda, through the Scottish Learner Journey Review, and indeed through the uh, activity I'll be taking forward through the Future Skills Action Plan and the National Retraining Partnership. Thank you. Question four has not been lodged. Question five, Patrick Harvey. Thank you to ask the Scottish Government what implications would arise under the fiscal framework if the UK Government made a significant rise in the threshold for the higher rate of income tax. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Well, the net impact on the Scottish budget will depend on how any tax cut is funded. A reduction in our UK income tax receipts would, all else being equal, result in a positive adjustment to the Scottish Block grant. But if it was funded through spending cuts, there could be a negative knock-on effect through Barnlet. So I would strongly caution the incoming Chancellor against any reserved tax increases in Scotland to fund tax cuts for the RUK rich. Patrick Harvey. Uh, this policy has been uh, promoted by its advocates on the basis of the rather spurious concept of fiscal drag, which ignores the fact that people are only going to be paying more tax if they're earning higher incomes. But if it's implemented, it will inevitably lead to more pressure uh, from people with a similar mindset calling on reductions on taxation for high earners in Scotland. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that we must, we must be absolutely resolute in saying that we will not move one inch in that direction? Uh, and that, for example, any MP or MSP advocating this policy could be fairly accused of naked self-interest? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, it will be MPs that make the decision around national insurance contributions. It will be MPs that make the decision around the uh, our UK income tax system. Of course, the UK fiscal policy and tax policy will impact on ours because of the fiscal framework. I do agree with Patrick Harvey, though, that at, uh, at this point in time, or at any point in time, it is perverse to focus on tax cuts for the richest in society, simply to stimulate the Tory membership rather than stimulate the economy. We set out four tests in our income tax policy, which I would apply to future decisions. But yes, I would urge the any Tory candidate, not that they'll listen to us, of course, on any matter, but I uh, encourage uh, Tory candidates, any new incoming Tory Chancellor, to resist the urge just to pander to the Tory membership and make tax decisions that are right for the country. And surely that is to support a more progressive regime that has a fairer system of income taxation, but can also invest in the public services and fairness of our country. Murdo Fraser to be followed by James Kelly. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. Uh, talking of the Tory membership, uh, presiding officer, perhaps I could ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary this. Uh, today, according to the Fraser of Allender Institute, the SNP's £500 million tax rate on hard-working Scottish families hasn't actually raised an extra penny for public services. It's all disappeared into the black hole that's been created by more slowly growing uh, income tax receipts than previously expected. So what exactly is the Cabinet Secretary going to do about uh, this uh, particular problem? How is he going to uh, fill uh, that gap with the powers at his disposal? 
Cabinet Secretary. In terms of the figures that have to be reconciled, I've addressed this at committee and through the medium-term financial strategy, uh, the issues that we have. There is an issue, whether it's cyclical or whether it's structural, of deepening inequality across the whole of the UK that's driving faster wage growth for those at the top end of the system. So again, even under that circumstance, I think it is perverse for a, a prospective Tory Prime Minister to be looking at how to give further tax cuts uh, to the richest in society. In relation to the figures that have been outlined, what are the benefits of having a devolved income tax system? Well, so that we can make income tax fairer, as we've done in Scotland, where 99% of people are actually paying less tax in the current financial year than they were in the previous financial year. 55% of taxpayers are paying less in Scotland uh, than they would be if they were living south of the border. And our tax policies have actually and will raise that extra half a billion pounds that if we had followed the tax because the current or the previous tax position of the Tories would have cost public services half a billion pounds. It would have been half a billion pounds from Scotland's public services to pay for the last round of tax cuts that Tories proposed, never mind the next round of tax cuts for the richest in society. And I will, as always, balance Scotland's finances in a competent and prudent way. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the shortfall in tax revenue of a billion pounds forecast, forecast by the Fiscal Commission and the potential impact on the Scottish budget, it's disappointing that the Cabinet Secretary's medium-term financial strategy has been described as inadequate. Does the, does the Cabinet Secretary not think it's time that he rewrote the financial strategy in order to take account of the tax forecasts and also to outline how the government are going to meet key policy targets of funding public services, tackling poverty and reducing climate change emissions. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, presiding officer, the uh, medium-term financial strategy does exactly take account of the SFC forecast on taxation. It'll do, so, it'll do so again at the next fiscal event, which is the Scottish Budget. And it is at that point that we set out how we approach the reconciliation issues eh, and some of the other issues that James Kelly eh, has eh, eh, referenced. I've also attended Finance Committee to give evidence. I think I was there for about two hours. I'd happily stay longer if members, including Mr Kelly, Mr Fraser and others, had further questions. And I've gone through the kind of approaches, I've gone through the... I've gone through, and I know they like the answers so much, they can hear them again at some point in the future, but probably I don't have time to do it justice here eh, and now, presiding officer. But essentially, I've outlined, in terms of income tax reconciliation, the options that we have do include looking at the wider financial envelope. That's driven by UK tax and fiscal policy as well. The overall settlement to Scotland, because the Barnet, the settlement to Scotland is still the majority of funding that the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government has. The borrowing powers in terms of income tax re reconciliation eh, for forecast error. Because let's bear in mind, the income tax reconciliation figures are about forecast error. And then going forward, we look at how we grow our economy. And the SFC <coughs> report and the FIA, FAI commentary says that the greatest challenge and threat to Scotland's economy right now is Brexit. It's Brexit that needs to be averted to be able to help us grow our economy and that would uh, lift uh, the economic uh, forecast overall for Scotland. And of course there's a range of other decisions that we'll take around spending, not least on inequality and poverty that we're getting on with and doing the day job whilst others are totally misdirecting themselves on that Brexit catastrophe. Question number six, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what value of the third, the third sector is to the Scottish economy. Minister Kate Forbes. The Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations estimate that the third sector contributed more than £5.5 billion to the Scottish economy in 2016-2017. The sector employs more than 107,000 people and in addition the value of formal volunteering is estimated to be around £2.2 billion per year. Brian Whittle. I can thank the Minister uh, for that answer and given uh, her noting the significant value that the third sector has to the Scottish economy, can I ask how that investment in the third sector is evaluated and does she agree with me that uh, further investment into the third sector would be cost effective and further benefit the Scottish economy? Minister. Well, I would agree that um, we need to support and fund the third sector, which the Scottish Government is already doing. The third sector budget for 2019-20 has been set at £24.9 million. And, of course, new investment is necessary because 
of the great work that the third sector does in tackling poverty and mitigating UK government welfare changes, particularly over the last few years. So we will continue to invest, we'll continue to commit to providing multi-year funding, we'll continue to invest in the Invest in Communities Fund, all because of the growing inequality, which of course tax cuts at the top don't do anything to support. Question seven, Dean Lockhart. Thank you very much. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how the Finance Secretary determined the budget allocation for its proposed publicly owned energy company. Minister Kate Forbes. Allocation of individual portfolio budgets is a matter for the relevant portfolio ministers and are subject to consideration by the relevant committee as part of the budget scrutiny process. Dean Lockhart. Thank you. The establishment of a publicly owned energy company was first announced by the First Minister almost two years ago. However, according to the most recent update from the Scottish Government, this energy company hasn't even passed a feasibility assessment. Is this another example of the SNP over-promising but under-delivering on a flagship policy? Minister. On the contrary, this is an example of the SNP thinking innovatively and trying to tackle some of the very deep-seated social issues that affect our society. We recognise that uh, a new energy company could do a lot to tackle fuel poverty, to promote consumer engagement in energy matters and over time contribute to economic development opportunities, which I think Dean Lockhart supports. And Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. I would hope that a publicly owned energy company would show a commitment to the Scottish supply chain which would support companies such as Bifab. Can I take this opportunity to ask the Minister if the Government is seeking a meeting with EDF and if they intend to include the trade unions in this? Minister. Uh, I know the Cabinet Secretary, Derek McCall, has met with EDF. Thank you very much for that. And on that note, we end portfolio questions. We'll just take a short pause as we move on to the next item and Ministers, Members and Presiding Officers, change seats.